So um, we're just coming up to the, the, the very last part of our um, discussion today. So could Xavier, if you could grab a seat. And, and just while you're taking the seat, just to comment that lunch will be brought in and, and brought to your table, so you needn't get up. Um, and if anyone needs the train, um, there are, I think there are a couple of cars to bring people to the train station. Um, I think it's, it's, it's good to have a, a discussion here today. The, 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 the European Commission just, just announced the uh, intention to bring up the European greenhouse gas reduction targets to 55% by 2030 from, from the current target of 40%. So, and uh, if you think your job wasn't hard enough, um, which is good to. Um, Bring us along to the Q and A session. So we will um, we'll have about ten minutes of Q and A, and then we'll have lunch. So um, if there's any burning questions, John, ask them here. Or look, have we got a mic? Or just a microphone here, to John. Ask them. The PowerPoint should be circulated to everyone. Yeah. I suppose is a, a reflection of the technologies um, and I suppose optimally we're engaged with that scale at the moment because that's the optimum for the technologies um, I'd probably point to a scenario that will be medium scale initially just given that that's where it's at the market and that we see the scale going down rather than up um, the, the Danish model is literally the polar opposite of what we would be promoting the, the Danish model is like, uh, like Richie was explaining his really really big plants um, we don't have the road infrastructure in Ireland for that for one thing and building pipeline infrastructure is very expensive so we don't see that as a scenario but we do see a scenario that initially the market would be at a medium scale it will support probably large scale farmers initially uh, clusters of farmers definitely uh, like Javier's uh, feasibility study for Dingle the, the scale of that is about half the minimum size we're talking about here and we would see that as probably quite achievable in the time frame between concluding the feasibility study completing detailed design Bear in mind you're talking about at least four years out in the future, just being practical. Uh, we're actively engaged on technologies that will be very suitable for that scale and even possibly smaller at that stage. Uh, so we'd be very comfortable saying that yes, the, the road, the route to market will be medium scale, maybe even a couple of large scale initially, but actually decreasing in scale and time. And that will create more opportunities for the, the, the smaller communities and individual farmers. It, it's worth mentioning we are involved in a separate feasibility study for a smart, uh, let's say, a farm scale, where it's um, food production on the farm with food waste available there, much, much smaller scale again, and again the challenge is to find the breakthrough, you know, to, to find the technology and the business model that will stack up. Just wondering on the economics of yeah. the economics of transportation of the biogas emissions to there and emissions to, to, to use the, um, so the 50 kilometer radius yeah, um, yeah. scheme and in, in terms of even looking at things like compressed air storage moving, moving energy around can have a knock on um, uh, uh, I suppose impact on the financial model that underpins it and, and a, a, a second question from a note which is um, to do with the LNG plant in Shannon, um, surely it would make more sense to do bioenergy and hydrogen there and uh, to, to, to see that as a feasible alternative. Uh, yeah, uh, on the transport, um, transporting of natural gas, as a, which is the spec we're using, is quite efficient. So if you reseat it in a, in a 40 foot container, 
Uh, with composite tanks, we can compress gas to 250 bar. We can transport, I believe it's about nine and a half, um, sorry, 95 megawatt hours per delivery. Um, and the energy consumed by the vehicle, the tractor unit towing it, would be equivalent to point, uh, 0.5 of a percent per 50 kilometers. So it's, it's very e efficient to move energy dense uh, gas, if you know what I mean. Uh, liquefied gas uh, in a and, and you can actually we are looking at projects to go uh, liquefaction of biomethane that's even more energy dense and even more cost effective to move but the capital costs are too high at the moment and um, certainly to your second point you know obviously we're promoting renewable gas we see that the scenario to achieve our 2050 targets will rely on 100 percent indigenous sources of gas ideally and yes there'll be routes to decarbonize gas with carbon capture and storage but Fundamentally, it's the, the business case is all about being indigenous and displacing imports rather than being dependent on other alternative imports. So, you know, we see Ireland as having the capacity to supply 37% of our gas with biomethane sources very effectively, very sustainably. Uh, other technologies like which you was describing, like hydrogen conversion, and there are so many technology options that we have in that space, to be honest, that are very, very compatible, which could increase the biomethane potential for the country. Uh, we'd certainly get to greater than 50%. I would say that if, based on demand and bear mind, power generation will still be running on gas, we believe, even in 2050. The reality is there will still be a significant portion of uh, natural gas consumed, and we believe the power gen sector will still be the dominant consumer of natural gas at that stage. We would see all of heat and all of transport be running totally on renewable gas only. Uh, and for those guys, probably the cheapest source of natural gas they can get and a carbon capture and storage solution is probably what they'll most likely use. Yeah, the, the fracked gas is, is a higher carbon um, footprint than coal. So yeah, yeah, exactly. totally true, you know what I mean? So obviously it depends on your source. So the full life cycle assessment of the source of gas, it's kind of a gas field to wheel if it's a transport use or gas field to meter if it's a, a heat use. Uh, full LCA has to be t uh, carried out and obviously uh, uh, a fast, or sorry, a fracked gas source is more uh, carbon intensive than a non-fracked or a deep well uh, solution. Um, you know, I, I personally would think that there's a lot more deep well solutions and, and bear in mind our European network is connected all the way across Europe and there's a lot of other gas fields there. We cross the Mediterranean down to North Africa. Uh, so there is decades and decades of uh, deep well uh, natural gas available. Fracked gas by nature is kind of, if you imagine, Deep well gas is, you know, the it was biogas millions of years ago that from our dinosaur population back then. Fracked gas is kind of the same, but it's actually only, you know, hundreds of thousands of years old. So it's a newer form of gas and in reality it's probably best to be left down there for future generations rather than, than utilise too much of it. Yeah. Yeah. Take a question over here. Uh, yeah, uh, Gideon Murphy, uh, Council of Government. Um, I was interested literally to hear from your uh, talk of When you look at beach, when you look at beach cast seaweeds, there are num there are not there are three types of seaweed. There's red, green, and brown. Um, is it Ulvalactuca? Is the one that is it sea lettuce that keeps washing up, or is it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Is it brown stuff? Yeah. That's actually that's actually quite a good source of biogas um, for an anaerobic digester. Um, ideally, you would like if you were to build a seaweed biogas industry. And the legalities of this, I'm not quite sure about. You'd ha you'd, you'd, har you'd harvest it at the time where the biogas yield is highest. If it washes up, you're kind of stuck with when you get it, and you can incite it. In our lab, we made silage out of seaweed. Um, some of them worked very well, some of them didn't work at all, and they absolutely stank. Um, <laughs> but when you incite it, you can either, that means that you can prolong the amount of time you can feed that seaweed to a digester. So instead of feeding X hundred tons to a digester in a week, um, you could clamp it in a silage clamp and then feed it slowly over a period of time 
along with cattle slurry, along with grass silage. And in our lab, we have co-digested seaweed with um, cattle slurry, actually. There's laminaria digitata mixed with cattle slurry. So it does work, and yeah, you basically can't put it, feed it in with the rest of it. Thanks, Paul. Great to meet you. My name is Chairman Irish Land Council Association. Uh, a little slightly off topic, but I do hear mention of carbon capture and storage, which <coughs> usually gets my attention. Um, does anybody realistically think we're going to store gas indefinitely? Anything? And I just find that I think many in the audience will have seen the video on the television of the gas escaping from a storage unit in, I think, in California. Uh, I just don't know that that's a very clever idea, leaving that for next hundred thousand generations. So if we store it in liquid form, maybe. If we store it in solid form, I think maybe I could flip it over, but I think that would be okay. But store it in gas form, I don't know that that should really be part of this equation, in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, bear in mind, I'm not an expert in the, in the, in the geological storage, um, <coughs> but we have completed quite a few studies around the gas fields off Cork, the, the old Kinsale fields. This is seven gas fields off of Kinsale. Uh, two of them are very low pressure at this stage. They would have started their life at about, I think it was 70 or 80 bar pressure. Uh, and at this stage, they're nearly fully depleted and they're down to nearly, I think it's only about five bar. So in essence, um, based on geological assessment, it would show that in a gaseous form, CO2 would work very well in those kind of fields, but geologically, they're, they were gaseous to begin with, but never in liquid form. Uh, liquid CO2 is typically only suited to very, very deep wells that would have been, you know, that the pressure is so significant that the methane would have been in a liquid form to begin with, if you know what I mean. And we don't have any examples of those kind of fields anyway, so it's just, you know, we don't have the option to consider it. Uh, however, our Norwegian colleagues uh, would have a lot of deep, deep sea uh, former natural gas wells that would have had the original methane in a liquid form. So they would look at <coughs> liquefied CO2 as being compatible for those kind of wells, if you know what I mean. That's a very high level view, and don't get me wrong, I'm not a, I'm not a, 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 start, I'm not a geologist. Uh, that just presumes the cell, the seal is going to work for the next million years. Yeah, indeed, and I suppose the methane got in there in the first place because it was retained for millions of years. If you know what I mean, so. Oh yeah, all of it, that's the way. <laughs> I'm going to time the discussion out because it's, I, I think, Thanks, Paul. I think there's a, there's, there's a lot, I know the European Commission put up a, roughly about a, a billion euros over the last, 15 years for research and development on carbon capture and storage, and I, I think it will be something that it will be in, uh, researched and, and so on, but I, I wouldn't pin our future hopes on it just yet. Uh, we have another question here. No, I, I was just going to add, as a geologist, um, <laughs> the, there has been an awful lot of research done, and I suppose as Ian alluded to, gas that goes in, say for example, into your head gas field, has been down there for about 45 million years. So we do, I mean, the seal, as you said, does also have integrity as well. It has been altered from the first estate due to the well going in and different things, the decompression, decompression of the gas field. But like every kind of industry in the world, the oil and gas industry has gone through restrictions with uh, safety regulations. Um, it's not something that would be put down there for anything. And the tests that we have done so far on the carbon capture and storage aspect the actual secondary cast box, which is part of the EU legislation. So it can't just be one cast box, it has to be two. So it does seem like in the future it's going to be quite a safe, uh, renewable asset for us as well. And that leads us neatly into lunch, everyone. So that <laughs> 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 thank you very much for the panel.